Hello everyone, welcome to another live hangout here at Boys Essentials. I hope you are all having a great weekend. I know so many of you are still in your Sunday, as is our special guest that we're I'm going to introduce you to uh, in a moment, Professor Lynn Helding. But it is Halloween here in Australia. It's it kind of feels funny to say that because in Australia, we don't <clears throat> we don't really celebrate Halloween, but we kind of do. We're we're kind of taking on a little bit of a Americanization here, and uh, and so. I don't know if you're in the chat, Aussies, do, do we, don't we? I, I, I don't know. I know that we've got some candy ready to go. Even See, even calling it candy, we, we call it lollies, confectionery here in Australia. Um, uh, we've got some candy ready to go just in case we have some trick-or-treaters. But anyway, I know that many of you um, Americans do celebrate Halloween. It's a big deal, so happy Halloween for tomorrow. Um, and... Uh, but I don't want to spend any time going through all of that sort of jazz today. I really want to spend as much time as we possibly can with our special guest today, Professor Lynn Helding. And we're going to talk, I'm going to introduce you to this lady who has contributed so much to the world of vocal pedagogy and voice science over the years. So let's get straight to it. We'll catch you in a moment. Sound check. Check one. Check two. Hello, Professor Helding. Thank you for joining me today. Hi there, Dan. So good to be here. It's I I said to you in the pre-show, and I'm going to restate it because it is very true. It is an absolute honor and privilege to have you here on the show. And I'm so um, thrilled that you <laughs> that you accepted my invitation to come on <laughs> on what is your you know, I think it's uh, approximately 8 p.m. at the moment for you. In, yes, it is. In it's California. <laughs> so I've known of you for, for many years because uh, you have a, uh, a, a contributed as a an associate editor um, in, on for the Journal of Singing. For those who don't know, there's kind of two major sort of leading uh, journals, academic journals in the era of singing, one of them being uh, the Journal of Voice and the other one being the Journal of Singing. And uh, I've had I've had the privilege of having a couple of articles um, published in, in the Journal of Singing, but you're one of the editors and, might I add, the new chief uh, editor-in-chief. Yes. So you're, yes. you're the new boss lady. Well, not, not quite yet. I'm actually the editor-in-chief elect oh, right. until May 1st, 2023. But uh, between now and May 1st, we have a lot of work going on behind the scenes to transfer some of our, our work into the digital realm. So right. it's, been a, it's going to be a long runway. So, but I, so I am at work, but I am at work under that title. So. One one the mind boggles excuse the pun for today's topic <laughs> yes. but the mind boggles at how you're going to fit all that in because yes. you because you are also the coordinator of vocology and voice pedagogy at um the university of southern california thornton school of music <laughs> do you do you have extra hours in your day like what's going on well, I, I, <laughs> the mind is boggled. Uh, I'm really, really lucky that my dean uh, allowed me to take a course release. And uh, actually, one of the reasons I came to here to USC was so that I could create the curriculum. And I'm thrilled that after seven years, I have enough uh, graduate students, doctoral students, uh, one in particular. So shout out to my doctoral student, a doctor, Melissa Trankman, who took my undergrad voice science class uh, this semester. So hopefully she'll be doing that uh, in the years to come, which just gives me a little bit extra breathing room to, to do the editor-in-chief job. Uh, but, you know, it's priorities. I mean, I don't... Um, it really is. You know, people used to say to me, do you sleep? And I said, oh, of course I sleep. And I get eight hours too. Um, and I managed to get my yoga and my exercise in every day. So, you know, it's, it is priorities. There are probably some other things that don't happen 
um, well, it's way, it's, but... it's possibly those personal disciplines that do empower you to do what you yes. do. I, I think so. So I think that's a really, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but I do think it's really important for, um, especially for our students to understand as they're coming up that, yeah. you know, there really isn't any great honor in suffering no. that much for your work or your art. And yeah. you do have to take care of yourself. And, yeah. you know, if you make choices, um, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on social media, like zero. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't also spend a lot of time, you know, watching television or things like that. So, yeah, you know, it's amazing what you can get done when you prioritize the things that are important. And and I and I haven't spent much time on television in the last week either because I've been reading your book, which I want to <laughs> which I want to get to in a moment. I when when I first reached out to you and said I'd love to 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 interview you and you said yes. And by the way, have you read my book? And I said, no, but I, I I had ordered it at that point. Then it took another, I think, six weeks to arrive. It only arri arrived last Wednesday. So oh, I, no. I've been busily <laughs> squirreling away through and I only got halfway, but I, I, I did get to the end of chapter four. So we're, we're, there's so much we want to cover. That's the end point of our discussion today. I want to just back up a little bit so that people can understand a little bit more about you and and your history in the area of singing and how it is that you came to be uh, Professor Lynn Helding. All right. Well, where do you want to start, Dad? Let's start with you as a singer. Okay. Well, I mean, like most people, I started singing, you know, as a kid, I would say maybe in high school, um, you know, sang in high school choirs, sang in the musical production, and but I was also a pianist. I started playing the piano as a pretty young child. Um, I think maybe about age six or something like that with uh, with piano lessons. And I had a very influential piano teacher who decided when I was in middle school, uh, she really became transformed, I think, by piano pedagogy herself and uh, told all the parents she was going to switch to a system of three lessons per week. Uh, one was the traditional old fashioned piano lesson uh, with repertoire, but then the other two were really unusual. Um, there was a group lesson in which we did music theory and we did a lot of improv. We did dictation. We did all kinds of uh, really just fascinating musical skill learning and then we in the, the partner lesson which was the third lesson we sort of put those two worlds together so that was really influential mm. for me and I, I I did that up through high school and then I got really involved in theater and uh, singing and uh, decided to major in in uh, vocal performance in college so that's kind of how singing happened by the time I started college I was doing a lot of musical theater but I didn't really know. I, I grew up in a really small town in Montana, which is in the northwest part of the United States, um, not a big hotbed of opera. So I really I saw my first opera production when I was 18. Right. And uh, it was, you know, I, I'm not going to say that it was, you know, hugely transformative. I just had been playing classical music my whole life and I just didn't know that there was this whole world out there of classical singing. I mean, of course I knew about it, but it just hadn't really occurred to me. It was something I could do. And when it all came together, it came together pretty quickly because I had this strong musical skill set from my piano teacher. And I just, I loved the language. I loved the discipline of it. Um, it just was more of a challenge to me than the musical theater part. Mm -hmm. I never lost my love of mu musical theater singing. And at the end of my singing career, I did end the last couple of years before I just decided to quit singing uh, with a jazz trio. And we did, um, I did a lot of sound time. I wrote my own scripts. So it was a real cabaret evening of just talking and talking about, you know, love and life and all those wonderful topic. So that's kind of the quick sketch. Um, I had a lot of early success, I guess, as a, as a youngster, I won a lot of competitions and that sort of thing. Um, but I always was very curious about why certain things, certain things we've all been told, you know, like you can't sing that aria because it's too heavy for you. And I didn't know what heavy meant. And I was always curious why. 
So, you know, I was the, the curious little owl that asked why instead of what. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't, um, I, I guess I was sort of born to that inquisitive questioning part. And then, um, you know, I, I had a pretty standard issue classical uh, training and experience, I think, up through, I don't know, mid early 30s. I got married, I had two children, I got a full time teaching position, but I was always wanting to know the why. And so every time I could escape and go to a summer program or a, some kind of a workshop about voice science, I did that. And so I sort of checked the box on all of those and did those things. And in the first summer of the Summer Vocology Institute, which is run by uh, Dr. Ingo Tietze here in America, in Utah. Mm. Uh, I met um, Dr. Kitty Verdolini, who is a voice scientist yes. and a co-author with Ingo of Vocology. Vocology, yes. And she is the one that really turned me on to the cognitive science. And that was, that was sort of the holy grail because I remember sitting in her class and just offhandedly she said, well, you know, knowing what to train does not really translate to knowing how to train it. And I just went, oh, that's it. That is exactly the question I've been asking for so long. And, you know, we, we know that there are amazing singers out there who end up being marginally good teachers. And flip side, there are some people who are amazing teachers who maybe never had the fabulous career. So it's a that was always a really interesting question to me is how is it that people who sing so beautifully can't always articulate how they do what they do yeah. they can tell you what they can certainly tell you why but they can't always explain it um and then of course when we cross voice types right it's we might be able to explain to in my case another mezzo soprano but how do i teach a tenor how do I teach a baritone? How do I teach a belter if I want to yeah. teach musical theater? So those were always, always, always questions I was very um, sort of dogged in pursuing and, and always have. So I have this strong sort of translational science background along with the cognitive stuff, uh, which was about a 10 year project for me. So that was uh, that was a real labor of love. It took a, a long time to do all the research and write that book. And 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 we've all benefited from the results of that those 10 years. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I just, without seeking to go down the tributary of, of that um, uh, mind blowing comment by um, uh, uh, Kitalini, I, I wonder. Oh yeah. I wonder whether, it, does that, do you think that speaks to the art of teaching? That, that it is. Yes. It is that ability to um, deliver the information in a manner that it can be consumed by the receiver. Yeah, I do because, you know, the art of teaching is really to understand, literally understand where someone else is coming from. So you can know all the things in the world you know, right? You can, you can know physics, you can know math, you can know the physiology behind voice science, but if you don't, know how to get that information into the mind of another person, let alone into the body, which is what we're talking about with motor learning, um, you're not a very effective teacher. So I do think you're exactly right about that, the art of teaching. Yeah. I, 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 I want to I wanna get into this. It's, uh, I'm spoiled for choice today as to the topics that we could cover. <laughs> So I'm, I'm hopefully we're going to be able to step this out in a really consumable way for those of, uh, who are watching and listening. But I did want to start off one of the most interesting chapters that you that that you kick off with with um, the musician's mind. And again, there there it is for everyone who is interested at, at home. Um, and I'll, I'll I'll put the uh, the APA in in the information after the show, but. I, I wonder um, I wonder whether we can kick off talking about some of the myths because I found some of these really interesting because there's so many over the years 
uh, there are so many um, uh, myths, ways of that we've been taught to think about things that when we continue with that as the foundation, it leads us to incorrect conclusions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say it leads us to conclusions that also are not helpful for us as learners in whatever field. You know, it's not just it's not just about whether it's correct or not. It's is it helping your life? Yeah. <laughs> to persist in some of that mythology. So, and, and one of those and we were just throwing that out there. Yeah. One of those foundational pillars, which I found really interesting, that has been really confronted in recent years is is the um, ideology or the philosophy I don't know what would be the correct term of, of behaviorism yeah I, I wonder whether you could unpack that a little bit for us because I think that was it such an important grounding point that you that you formed in the book to then launch into the other points that you right. make. Well, I mean, and I don't <laughs> presume to know. I, I was careful in the book to say, even though I know that uh, the book was going to be read in, you know, many English speaking parts of the world, I don't presume to know what your school system is there in Australia or for that matter, you know, in the UK. I just know here in America, there's, um, uh, there's this idea that uh, we've been marinated in it. <laughs> so, uh, that's not my quote. That comes from one of the people I quote in the book. But, um, you know, this idea that none of us do anything without, uh, without immediate reward. And it turns out that's actually not true. Most humans are um, motivated by what we might call intrinsic worth and merit. So we see now from uh, sociological studies in psych social psychology that the things that will drive people to a different job, a better job, are not necessarily the things we thought, like more money. Um, instead, people will often give up money, salary, for a job that's more interesting, or yeah. for a job that challenges them, or a job that... Uh, gives them a better sense of self-worth. Um, so this is, this is the book really starts with going back to the 19th century, which is really where, you know, the modern day psychology is, is born um, and sort of talks, I don't talk a lot about uh, Freud or mentalism, but go into the early 20th century and behaviorism really starts in the uh, late well, it starts around 1918, 1920, much earlier than most of us think. We think of the Cold War era, the 1950s, and that really was sort of the apex of it. Mm. But it goes back to the idea that this, the field would not study anything that wasn't, quote, directly observable. And so, of course, what that leaves out for people like us, people like artists, is the whole in, inner world. You know, whatever word we want to give that, whether that's a spiritual world or an artistic world, it left the, the human part of being human out. And so I, uh, I call that the rescue of emotion, which we really mm. can ascribe to several, ironically, several scientists, uh, most famously Antonio Damasio, who wrote Descartes' Error mm. uh, based on that premise. And so the last chapter of the book very purposely circles back to the rescue of emotion and empathy, and that is the realm of the artist. I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just at this juncture, I, I just thought that uh, it's it's really worth me saying for for those of, um, who are, are listening and watching that the value of our discussion today really speaks to um, how we learn and 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 how we can really further enhance our learning as singers. And so, if you're wondering, if you're watching and going behaviorism i didn't i didn't sign up for this the value of what we're going to be talking about and learning from uh professor helding today is is found in un, these understandings really do um equip us to become better learners in this specific case of, of our singing um uh, uh, one other um uh and one other uh, myth that really stood out to me because i think i'm convinced i heard a, a politician on the TV here in Australia, just recently, kind of quote this as a stalwart of or a, a, a just a standing under understanding of 
the first three years being the most oh. important. And, yes. and it, it does, it gets rolled out um, yeah. as, as, as if it's, well, uh, if you didn't know that, where have you been? You've been under a rock. Can you explain yeah. to us a little bit about why that is no longer um, uh, an, underst- uh, uh, an, an acknowledged fact? That's a great, well, I mean, first of all, we always should start any discussion of the human mind uh, this way, which is that the human mind is the most complex entity in the known universe. And the first thing that that does, at least for me, is makes me very humble. Um, So we can never say black and white anything about, uh, you know, such a complex entity and us as complex beings. But, you know, I guess the first thing about that first three years was the discovery that we are born um, with only too many synaptic connections, too many brain cells. And what happens in those first three years is that those brain cells get pruned away. Um, And so it's a little bit backwards than most of us would think. We would think that we get born with this sort of infant brain and that it grows bigger and stronger and better as we grow with age. But that's and of course, that happens too. Remember, it's complex. But uh, these synaptic connections get pruned away. And when this was first discovered in the late, in the mid to late '80s, and I don't, I don't mean discovered scientifically. I mean when it finally sifted into the popular imagination. Um, it really freaked people out, <laughs> and it, it was not any time before people were saying it was this idea that if you didn't do it in the first three years, all hope was lost. <laughs> and um, so, if you want a word for what changed, the word is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. That yeah. that is really the dogma of the late 1990s uh, that changes everything. So, a great book for people on that is by Norman Doidge, and it's called The Brain That Changes Itself. Um, it's a really beautiful book in a lot of ways because, and the, the reason I like it so much is that he makes such a big deal of saying, this is a big deal, and this is a life changer for people to understand that you can change your everything. You can change your patterns of thought. You can change um, poor behaviors, bad behaviors, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy works because of neuroplasticity. It's not because we're going to go lay on the couch and talk about all the wrongs that were done to us. Um, it's really about how you change your thinking to change your behavior. And it sounds very sort of new agey, but it turns out that these synaptic connections are forged by habits of thinking. Mm. The same way that motor patterns, muscular patterns are forged by practice using them. So. Um, why it matters is that, yes, the first three years are important, but all hope is not lost. I mean, if, if those three years weren't great, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence that people can not just survive, but really thrive if they're pulled into a richer environment, if those first three years were, were not. Now, there's also a body of literature, and the book on that is called The Body Keeps the Score, Um, by Bernard van der Kolk, and that's a great book too, kind of from the opposite end, saying that if people um, have really, really traumatic experiences, those do lodge in the body for the same reason. It's that neuroplasticity. So I'm not saying that it's all good news, but why it matters to us is that, you know, we have this saying, right, that old dogs can't learn new tricks, and Mm. that's just simply not true. Yeah. Um, we may have to get through a little bit more stuff the more learning we've accumulated. That's that's true, but it doesn't mean that we can't learn new things, and it doesn't mean that we can sort of break free of also physical habits. Um, and this idea when people say, "Oh, I just can't learn that," you know, I'm a visual learner, mm. is so limiting. Yeah. You know, learning styles is also not accepted by cognitive science. You know, absent frank brain disorders, our brains are actually remarkably similar, at least physiologically. And of course, we'll never probably be able to untangle which is nature and which is nurture and how then they play out and play together. Um, But I think this idea of learning styles is also, it was a real fad, at least here in America. And 
there might be something to it. But what scientists say is a better way of thinking about it is that we have learning preferences. Mm -hmm. And oh boy, yeah, we have those. I yeah. have definitely, I do not prefer to learn math. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. I, I prefer to think in, in words and analogies and yeah. metaphor for sure. Yeah. But that doesn't mean then that I should shut that door completely and say, no, I'm a visual learner. I'm an auditory learner. I can't possibly learn that. I just think it's very self-limiting. Some yeah. of these, um, this brain mythology was very hot in the 1990s. At yes. Least here in America. Yes. If, if, if there were ever an example of the of just how powerful words are and how important they are. I think neuroplasticity is one of those because the moment you say the word, it really conjures exactly what it says, and it's, it, it gives it gives you that real under like almost immediate insight into what uh, he's getting at. Uh, and I mean, if he could have chosen a whole heap of other different ways to say it, but he obviously chose that word and it's been really important. Yeah, well that word is actually from cognitive science. It's not Deutsch's. It's it's a it is a <laughs> it is an accepted uh, working theory yeah. that the brain, you know, the brain is never fixed. Yes. It's constantly we know from cadaver studies that people at the moment of death are creating new brain cells, which is pretty astonishing. Yeah. Um, another writer said that the old mythology was you are you are born with the only brain you will ever have. <laughs> and cognitive scientists, just neuroscientists in particular, just find that laughable. You know, it's it's constantly kind of reorganizing and yeah. changing itself depending on the input. So yeah. that's why what we put in there, <laughs> you know, it isn't just the experience of living in the world that does it. It's our thought patterns. Yeah. You know, and this is why um, uh, PTSD and other um, really, tr you know, traumatic uh, disorders are having sort of a new day with cognitive behavioral therapy and some of these other therapy systems that are really built on changing the way you think about things. In the, and then you have to follow up with actually changing what you do instead of changing what you do in the hopes that it will change what you think it's a it's an it's an interesting inversion yeah one other yeah. you mentioned the 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 learning personalities or the learning preferences um which is uh how i've come to refer to it in recent years myself but the, one other myth that you you talk to in the book is around uh, right brain left brain and and uh well not so much as a myth as to you you further clarify what that actually is and what's going on there could you talk to that a little bit for us yeah i mean i think that's very similar it's um again we're talking about the human brain and the mind which is so complex mm -hmm. and yes there are certain um processes that generally reside in one half of the brain rather than the other. But uh, again, the science got out ahead of um, the way that it probably should have been taught to us and became oversimplified. And so that's where you get, you know, I'm a right brain thinker, I'm a left brain thinker. And it just is not that simple, not by a long shot, because the two halves of the brain are in constant communication with each other. And I would even say um, from, this is not my research by any stretch because I'm not a brain scientist, but uh, people like Gottfried Schlaug here at Harvard in the United States have done just really groundbreaking work on showing that uh, musicians and particularly Western classically trained musicians because they've learned to read musical notation um, as opposed to people who've just uh, learned to play by ear, we might say, have about 25% larger uh, corpus callosum, which is the super highway that divides the two hemispheres of the brain, probably because they're constantly communicating between the left and the right side. So even that idea for musicians, I think, is really limiting. Um, to sort of say, oh, I'm a right brain thinker is a little bit like saying I'm a visual learner. Yeah. It's it's just not not borne out by science. And 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 then if you say, well, who cares? I don't care about science. Uh, it's limiting. 
Yeah. It limits us. And that's, that's the, that's the piece of it that I'm most interested in uh, for myself and, and my students and my clients is to just not, let's not limit ourselves by this brain mythology. You yeah. Know? It's, 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 it's a process of decoupling oneself from what have been held up as sort of sacred cows, haven't they, yes. over the years? Yes, and they sure have. and being yeah. prepared to to acknowledge the new understandings, the new research, the new science, and let go of some of those held beliefs um, mm -hmm. that have become ingrained. Yeah, I wonder whether we can we can talk to to a really practical space for yes, for any singer. That. And, and I, I, I want to get into to, to the discussion of practice because yes. practice is something that we're all doing. Um, yep. We all, and you and I were talking earlier about, you know, your, your, your capacity for time management. Time is we, we all get given the same 24 hours and therefore we all want to use our 24 hours in the most efficient manner possible. Um, so I wonder if we can kick off by firstly just talking about practice but also talking about the difference between deliberate practice and mindless practice yeah well okay so the book um i take a lot from a, a relatively new field in psychology called expertise studies mm. uh, which was one of the founders is a, a k anders erickson who came up with this um this idea of deliberate practice, which he calls uh, a, a designed set of effortful activities designed to elicit certain target response. So in other words, it isn't just, as he says, mindless playing for enjoyment. It's actually a practice regimen that's designed, um, whether it's designed by yourself or by a coach, but it's, it's a plan, right? You have to have a plan before you go into it. Um, and the key word is effortful. And that's the hardest part, especially when you're, when you're uh, dealing with children or teenagers or even really young adults, is to get them to practice in a way that is e effortful um, rather than just mindless rote routine practice. Um, and this is pretty typical with young people. They love to play or sing the pieces that, that they know well and that they can perform well but that's not practicing. That's just literally running over a piece of music. Yeah. Whereas working on the things that are really difficult in classical music, I would say a really good example of that in singing the singing world is learning how to sing melisma. Um, yeah. I, you know, I feel it doesn't, it doesn't get taught enough. And because it hasn't been taught very uh, much in the last couple of decades, we're not then training the next generation mm. of singers to do mm. it. Um, and my personal theory, I have, of course, no evidence, but uh, I just think it's, it's a kind of singing that, uh, that can be very clumsy. Um, it can feel very awkward. Mm. Uh, it can feel ugly. It can make you feel like you're, you don't know how, what you're doing. <laughs> uh, and I think, um, but you have to, it's kind of like learning. Uh, I, do, I practice yoga and I find a lot of similarities to yoga where you have to be willing to fall on your face. Mm. You have to be willing to do a face plant. Mm. Uh, you have to be <laughs> willing for it to look, to look stupid. Yeah. To let your body rearrange itself and figure out how, how it's going to apply itself through space and time. Yeah. And I think learning to sing scale, rapid scale passages can be like that. And, you know, so I have a set of exercises. I, I insist all my singers learn how to sing melisma, regardless of whether that is something that their voice naturally gravitates to. Mm. It's that idea, right, of, well, maybe it is as natural for you, but you still, it's good for your voice, it's good for flexibility. And I give them, you know, exercises, but a lot of thought exercises as well, thoughts to go along with it. Um, so that when they feel sort of uncoordinated and it doesn't, it's not coming together, that they allow themselves time to sort of mess around with it, play yeah. around with it, and their body will reorganize and figure it out. So deliberate practice, there's this effortful um, part to it. There's also in motor learning studies in general, some very important, uh, what they call in that world, the laws of practice. And that just means um, tenets that they have understood and have stood the test of time. 
And I think one of the most important laws of practice for us as musicians is something called spaced practice. And what that means, it, it's, a, it's a time continuum. So, you know, remember I said I don't like to do math. So we'll do simple math and say, you know, if, you, if you're, uh, let's just say for ease, this is probably not a great number, but it's the one that's in my head today. If my goal was, um, was to do three hours of practice in one week, and I, my lesson was on Monday, and on Sunday, like it is here right now, I go, oh my gosh, I didn't do anything. And you run to the practice room and you do all three hours at one time. Um, first of all, much higher incidence of injury for uh, musicians, instrumentalists, and singers who practice all at once like that. But in terms of the cognitive benefit, um, there isn't one. Because part of what we're doing, particularly in the motor learning realm, is we're always kind of breaking things down a little bit yeah. before we build them back up. We're unlearning as we learn. And so... And then the other really important component of this is sleep. So yes. if you take the same amount of hours and you practice a half an hour a day over six days, you're going to get somewhere. Yeah. Whereas if you do that three hour mega session, not only are you at risk for injury, but cognitively speaking, you, you might actually end up regressing over time because you're in this kind of constant state of breakdown. Yeah. You're in this constant state of, wait, where was I? What was my plan? What, was I, what, what am I trying to accomplish? Whereas that spaced practice where there's a little bit every day and then you sleep on it and you're learning during sleep, by the way, because that's the time of the day when the brain puts things away in mm. its compartment <laughs> that it belongs to. and you know the next morning you wake up and a lot of people have had this experience uh, where they wake up the next morning and it's sort of like miraculously yeah the thing that you were struggling with the day before is kind of there yeah and that that, that has a lot to do with the new sleep studies uh, that have come out about brain cleaning it turns out uh, sleep is the the time of night when our brains also literally clean themselves uh go through there and get rid of the 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 brain cells that we're not using <laughs> get swept into the dustpan and the things that we went over and over and over through practice get remembered of mm. course there's a bad side to that too with performance anxiety so you can ruminate over something over and over and over and also wake up the next morning and it's stronger so it's that whole thing of you know, we want to put whatever we put in there and practice habitually um, is going to be the thing that we get really good at. Yeah. So deliberate practice uh, is it's such an important tenet from expertise studies, and it can be applied to just about any part of life. It's just I think for musicians, because it is such a huge part of what we do, um, but athletes, too. Right. Athletes, dancers. I mean, there, there's a, there are certain groups of people uh, with whom we share an affinity, and I think largely because of this idea of disciplined practice or deliberate practice. So that's that's there's a little bit of that, but there's a lot in there. Uh, in there's a whole chapter. Yes, there 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 is, and in fact, you go on important. you go on to talk about two other rules of practice. Um, one being varied practice, mm -hmm. and and the other being randomized. Practice. I right. wonder if you could just unpack both of those for us. Yes, those are those are kind of similar. Um, it's a little bit easier to understand in the physical realm, like uh, maybe a sport like soccer or something. Mm -hmm. So you know you can't have a soccer team go out and just practice left kicks for two hours. Yeah. Right. Um, we uh, we also know from motor learning studies when people practice the same gesture over and over again. They certainly get better at it. They'll sort of ratchet up. And then at some point, the, the climb stops, and they sort of plateau. And then they start to degrade in the same practice session. Mm -hmm. And the thought is, you know, I, there's a lot of interesting the, um, theory on that. But the easy way to understand it, and this is what I teach, is that we are complex beings, mm. you know? And we can sort of focus on one gesture, like one scale passage, a certain number of times yeah. and you know not too many minutes into that our mind starts to wander we start to sort of crave difference and crave you know context too yeah. 
not just I want to practice a different scale passage, but I want to see how that fits into this piece of music I'm working on. So the, the varied practice is just you do need variation. You can't just practice the same gesture over and over again. Um, and that has to do also with as many variations as you can think of. So can you vary where you are? Um, one of the tenets of, of learning is this, that, and I have this in the book, that I, th I think the quote is, and I think it's mine actually, uh, the sign that a thing is learned, the sign that a thing is learned is its repeatability. And then in motor learning we say, and then you add some other qualifications to that. So it's repeatability and can you do it the same every time? Can you do it the same level of success every time? Can you do it under different conditions? Yeah. Can you do it loud? Can you do it soft? Can you do it with an audience of five people? Can you do it with an audience of 50 people? Right. So that a sign that a thing is learned is its robustness under these variations. Yeah. And that's why we want to have uh, as performers, we want to sort of test that and and try out try out how things work in different settings. Um, it's traumatizing to do things too soon, mm -hmm. you know. But but let's say that you're a director and you've been blocking a show for two months. It's probably time to move into the theater <laughs> and see, <laughs> you know, if your people can maintain the movement that they've been practicing when the conditions are different. And yeah. if they can, it means they've learned their blocking. If you do it three days into the blocking process and they're all over the map, you know, you can't get angry at them for not learning because it was too soon to sort of introduce that variation. So back to your comment about the art of teaching, I think that's part of the art is mm -hmm. knowing when to start to add these levels of challenge and these levels of difficulty. Right. And, and it's, it's, when I teach my teachers, I tell them, yeah, it's like the Goldilocks rule. You know, there's too hard, yeah. there's too soft, yeah. and there's just right. And then, of course, the question is, well, what's the just right? And I go, that's the art of teaching. Yeah. Because that space is already so wide. There are a lot of ways that you can be just right. Yes. You know, you just have to learn over time how many variations you can pile on before you know the learner face plants yes and maybe the face plant is part of the deal like it is in yoga like that's yeah. how you learn you went too far yeah i i <laughs> often know? i often think of it in in the realm of physics around friction is if you you need friction for forward momentum but equally if you have too much friction there's seizure and there and it and there's something will stop and so with a learner i find with beginners it's the, the art of the teaching is to place enough in front of the learner that they are able to engage and, and feel the friction that they're learning something without it being so unachievable or unattainable for their level that everything seizes up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's a, I mean, and these are things I think, uh, you know, there's so many things that I learned in cognitive, uh, in research in cognitive science that really are this sort of folk wisdom things that we have all learned yeah you know along the way like you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink right and so what is that well that's we know that one of the number one rules or ingredients needed for successful learning is volition which is the fancy word for wanting to and then you know again the teachers always ask well then how can you make someone want it and the answer is you can't we can never, you know, make another human want to learn something. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> there are so many pieces of this that are things that are sort of ancient wisdom, but have been um, corroborated. I don't like to use the word proven, but just corroborated by the field, this field at this moment in time that, you know, you and I were talking before this the show about, um, how affirming some of it is too. Yeah. Because if you're a seasoned teacher and if you're good at what you do, you do sort of think, oh, well, I think that I've been doing that. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder it works. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I did. I'm pleased to report I had a number of affirming moments as I was reading your book, surrounded in mass by stuff that I was lear learning, you know, for the first time, which has just been um, amazing. I'm I'm so looking forward 
to to reading the rest because I'm literally only just past halfway. I'm looking at the time and I'm going, I, I knew I wouldn't have enough time. <laughs> I knew, I just knew I wouldn't. Before we kind of bring ourselves to a, a, a very, what, what is going for me going to feel like a very abrupt finish to our show, I wonder whether you can just briefly encourage us around how can we build our cognitive fitness as adult learners a lot of people watching the show are adult learners in the area of their voice what are some key things that we can do to really build that that cognitive muscle to empower our learning that is such a great question um and I'm going to violate one of my rules. I always tell my students, you know, we never tell a muscle what not to do. You have to tell it what to do. But honestly, I think in the current digital age in which we are living, probably the most important thing I would say is what we, what we well, like, I'll, I'll phrase it as a what to do. What to do is to turn these things off. Uh, when you're working, when you're reading, when you're trying to con- uh, concentrate on something, and don't just put them in silent. Uh, I turn mine off and I turn it over so I can't see any lights. I can't, uh, of course, it's off, so I'm not going to get any kind of um, buzzer. The work that's been done in, in so called attention studies is pretty jaw dropping and pretty disturbing. Um, because it turns out that we can actually, because of neuroplasticity, we can give ourselves ADD. We can create an ADD brain in a brain that was not predisposed to it. And that is by interrupting ourselves so many times that our ability to stay on task and focus becomes shattered. Um, Partly because you know, the, the human mind wasn't meant to do that. I mean, we are meant to scan and parse and think and be alert, you know, in our sort of primitive brains. And so concentrating on something for half an hour is a lot. Yeah. Um, and this is something I just talked to one of my clients this week and I, uh, she's having a hard time finding the practice time. She's a professional singer, um, but, you know, she has kids mm-hmm. and um, she's having a hard time finding all the time in the day. Mm. And I said, you know, you need to learn how to practice snack. And she's like, what's that? And I said, you need to learn that a half an hour with this thing off, you know, you go in your room, you put the sign on the door and it says, mom's busy, please do not disturb. (laughs) If you can focus and concentrate for a half an hour a day for six days a week, you will get somewhere. You absolutely will. Now it would be better if you could do 45 minutes, could probably be even best if you could do an hour but don't say to yourself because i only have i only have 20 minutes it's not good enough it's golden if you can focus and concentrate so cognitive fitness you know that's the i call it the triumvirate of learning is attention learning itself and memory those are the three steps and it is really true that we have to pay attention in order for learning to happen And it is also true that our attention is notoriously fragile and easily hijacked. Mm. Hence, these puppies and everything built around them have now been called the attention economy. Um, This is how social media works too, right? Is to try to get our eyeballs and three hours later, you're still scrolling on social media and where did the time go? so cognitive fitness is really built by uh, reclaiming your attention and uh, really, um, you know, honoring that part of our ability as humans because it is precious and it is really the first part of learning. And there are people who have uh, almost lost their ability to read a book or read a chapter Um, because they're constantly sort of interrupting themselves. But again, because of neuroplasticity, we know that we can train ourselves right back to that ability to focus. Now, for people who are diagnosed ADD and ADHD, I'm not talking about those people. Um, And those people are definitely out there. I'm just talking about um, people who don't have this disorder um, are sort of giving themselves this shattered attention by allowing themselves to have their time interrupted. 
Uh, so there are simple things you can do, like turn off the sounds on your phone, uh, turn it to grayscale so it's not so attractive to look at, keep track of how many times a day you're checking your messages, checking your email. Is it really that important? Um, those, if for people who really want to safeguard their their attention and make it stronger, that the first place to look really is attention yeah. itself. Do, do you know one of the key things that I did about two or three years ago is I turned all notifications off. I turned yes. them all off. Yes. And I went I went through a period of withdrawal. No, oh, no wow. question about it. But if it was freeing, yes. Um, and I by no means have you know have no addiction to to uh, particularly my inbox. My inbox, in, my inbox is my issue. My email inbox, um, but notifications when I turn those off, so freeing. So it allowed me to to focus again. Because in part, I was almost anticipating the notification. Yeah. Yeah. Anticipating so, and when people who have, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm. We do have to finish, which I'm really disappointed <laughs> by, um, because this has been so good, and I, I, I want to say it again. Uh, we started the 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 pre-show, and I think I said at the beginning, this has been a real honor for me. Thank you to have you on the show. You are such a widely highly respected professional within our field and you have taught so many of us so much for so long that um that it it, it was really a, a privilege to have you on the show and um is there is there anything that you would like to leave us with as a final thought oh gosh ah. Oh. Well, maybe uh, the only thing I can think of is I've just signed the contract on my second book. <laughs> so <laughs> that's not going to come out tomorrow, but uh, I'm going to be writing a book. Uh, the sub, I'm still working on the title, but the subtitle will be Practicing Science Informed Voice Training. Ooh. And I'm really going to be tying in some of the cognitive. Uh, methods, I don't say tricks, but you know, methods that mm. I use to teach or ways that I can help people think about very complex topics like vocal tract acoustics and formant tuning and some of the some of the parts of the acoustics piece that are so difficult for people to understand. So it's going to be uh, science through a translated uh, voice and also very mindful of how we actually learn how we process mm. information and and most of us learn best by analogy and metaphor. So it's going to be filled with a lot of that to help people understand these more uh, difficult scientific concepts. Well, I will be keeping an eye out for that book. I mean, I've got I've got to finish the first one first, but uh, <laughs> I'll be definitely lining up to read that because there there will I know that there will be so much value in in what you are yet to write. Um, so I'll keep an eye out for that. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. Thank you, Dan. It was great to talk with you. Really great. I, I am so humbled by, by the last 45 minutes. And I, and I know if you've been listening um, that you will have got so much out of today's chat. <laughs> I just, it just blows my mind as to the people that are so gracious with their time to come on to our, our little show here and, 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 and speak to our, our little global community called Voice Essentials. So I hope you've enjoyed today. Uh, next week we'll have uh, another Q&A, so make sure you've got your questions ready. It's where we, I do my best to answer your questions. Um, and uh, I always look forward to those because we have a lot of a lot of back and forth uh, with the live chat. And then in two weeks' time, we've got Professor Brian Gill coming on, long-time friend, long-time uh, supporter of the channel, and uh, so good to be having him again, who will be our last guest for 2022, uh, after which I think, do we have one or two shows after that, and then we'll finish up. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Happy Halloween to all of you uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly America, and I think do I think Canada celebrates Halloween. 
I hope you have a, a great festive day tomorrow, and I do look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Dr. Dan. Sing well.